good morning, good evening, good afternoon, all the participants of uh, this webinar. Uh, I am Dr. Nia Darbar, and I am actually the secretary of the ACNS Women in Neurosurgery, who has actually organized uh, this webinar. I uh, welcome to all our international participants. We are very honored to have them here on our panel. Um, I, will, uh, I will introduce Dr. Abida Shah, who will be actually running the entire show. Dr. Abida Shah is also a part of the ACNS Women in Neurosurgery. She, is, she conducts uh, and organizes all the workshops and the education. And uh, Dr. Abida Shah is a gold medalist from Mumbai. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the St. GF Hospital and KEM Hospital in Mumbai, India. She's a brilliant neurosurgeon, a skull-based neurosurgeon who has uh, got many awards and has many papers and leadership skills. So, Abida, handing over to you to run the webinar. This webinar is on complications of neurovascular surgery. Abida, to you. Thank you, Anila, for this kind introduction. And uh, this is our third online webinar of, by, organized by the ACNS WINS chapter. And we have had previous two webinars on uh, minimally invasive spine and on anatomy of the skull base. And this is our third one. As uh, complications is an integral part of our lives, I think it is important that we have these kind of uh, webinars on complications in neurosurgery. And without much ado, I think we should start. I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Suchanda Bhattacharji. She is an additional professor at the Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. She is a very active woman neurosurgeon in Mumbai, and she's in uh, sorry in India, and she's part of a lot of educational activities that happen here. And she's going to be talking to us on complications in giant aneurysm clipping. Over to you, Suchanda. Are you hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening in different time zones. So I thank the WINS team for giving me this opportunity to speak here, inspired by Professor Kato, of my deepest regards to her. As said, complications in giant aneurysm are a part of life. And uh, we learn more from each complications rather than from your success stories. So I would like to discuss a uh, disclosure that um, this is my mentor and he has a mammoth experience on giant aneurysms and I borrowed a couple of slides from him so that I can gather all the possible complications which we may have during a course of this difficult surgery. So when you have a bomb like this in the brain, what do you do? This is a young girl, a 28 year old girl who came on the... Yes. Please share your screen. We can't see your presentation. Share your screen. I'm sharing. Just a moment. I okay. You are hearing me? I can hear you, but I don't have your screen yet. Okay. Okay. Then. There is a green button on the yeah. On the lower panel of your screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Now you can switch on your PowerPoint presentation. I can see your screen now. Now you can see? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Fine. Is it? Perfect. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now you can begin. So this is a case which has uh, come. She's a young lady on the 28th day postpartum. Uh, we didn't have... Uh, a flow diverters then yet and so we decided for a bypass followed by uh, trapping or clipping but uh, we have lost her sadly enough while waiting for a day or two this is yet a very recent case where we had a huge uh, aneurysm of the basal tip incorporating the outgoing vessels and uh, came with the classical subarachnoid typical thunderclap headache and uh, he did not have any deficit so we went he also had an ECOM aneurysm, if you see here. So what would be the option? Either a clipping, where you can tackle both of them, but then it would be a difficult clipping of the basilla top because the neck was involving the outgoing vessel. So we decided for an endovascular, and uh, it was a stent and a coil, which was done, and then it would have been difficult to clip because you can see it's way beyond the uh, dorsum cell. 
So this is yet another scale where flow diverter was used. So these are the type of aneurysms in giant, which the treatment modalities which are used on routine. Now, let me just talk a little bit about giant aneurysm before really going into showing my complication list. Giant intracranial aneurysms has been defined as the ones which are greater than 25 mm. And why are these giant aneurysms a very difficult terrain? Because they have wide atheromatous neck. They're involved in the branches, the thrombus may be there, calcified walls are there, complex anatomy usually has in a giant aneurysm. Then I would like to add the decreasing surgical expertise with the evolution of antivascular techniques. So, you know, the, it's getting more and more difficult to operate in the coming days because the experience is dwindling to some extent. So if you look at the natural history from this trial, which all of us know, you can see that the posterior circulation aneurysm has an annual risk of bleeding to the tune annual risk of bleeding to the tune of 10% and anterior circulation aneurysm has a bleeding risk of about 8% annually. So we need to do something about them. We just can't leave them unattended, isn't it? So if you look at the natural history as reported by these authors, it was 68% and 85% in two and five years and around 100% mortality by another author reported it in his series at two years and 75% uh, died if left unattended. So collecting all the major series which were available, you can see that the success story is around 80% and the failure story falls to almost 25%, either mortality or morbidity. But then if you summarize, then this is how it looks. Mortality is almost up to 20% high. But then that was the series of the late 90s and the early 2000s. And in the current decade, if you look, this was the latest paper which came out from, uh, in, which is published in Neurology India. And it's a uh, single surgeon, Dr. Laligam Shekhar series. And he had six, 76 uh, aneurysms which he operated, uh, which included large and giant. And if you look at this, you can see that bypass was required in 63% of which ruptured was 32% and 68 was unruptured. And fairly, as we know in the literature, the anterior circulation aneurysms were more than the posterior circulation aneurysms. Now, if you look at these results, you can see that still, you there is a revision graph to the tune of almost 8%. And uh, But anyway, in the long-term follow-up, the results were pretty good. And if you look at his complication rate, you can see that the intraoperative rupture was to the tune of 1% and uh, stroke to the tune of almost 10%. And this is the usual story everywhere. And of course, there are miscellaneous communication, uh, complications like infections or death is almost to the rate of 7.9%. So this is the story everywhere, more or less here and there 5% plus minus. So what are the indications if you look to operate in a giant aneurysm? I'm not talking of endovascular, someone else is covering. These are essentially the criteria for a bypass in a giant aneurysm as well. Fusiform aneurysm where there is no neck, they are unclippable ones. The aneurysms where it is not possible to reconstruct a traditional neck. Aneurysms where flow divertors are risky and aneurysms where you need to increase temporary clipping time for the sake of reconstruction or there is a calcified or atheromatous neck. However, the classical indication in surgery remains a giant aneurysm with a white neck or partially calcified neck with branches arising from the sac. So when do you operate? When the transit time is more than three seconds during a simple compression test during angiography. This is easiest and safest, but definitely not the best. Balloon occlusion test is much, much accurate and the accuracy can further be enhanced with a neurological exam after 20 minutes or inducing hypotension, e.g. Doppler. So just a passing slide about bypass, what you do, you could be of three times, low flow, where you do STMC, occipital pica, or in a medial flow, where you use a radial artery, or a high flow, where you use a saphenous vein. Double bypass equals to a radial artery and can give circulation to almost a whole entire anterior hemispheric circulation. So how do we decide in a giant aneurysm? What we do is this, we do a cross circulation if it is poor, bypass, with ligation trap or ligation directly. If it is good, do a spec. If there's poor reserve, it goes for a bypass. If there is a good re reserve, you go for a ligation with a rescue MCA, ISTA bypass in order to increase the, you know, your capable or manipulation time. 
So this is how a trapping looks like, and this is how a ligation happens the, uh, diagrammatically. So in our, once again, to summarize, what we do is so CIC bypass in one stage, in the second stage, carotid ligation or trap ligation. What we do is we do a bypass, and then of, on the next day, we actually uh, open, the, open the neck wound, and we, uh, we just, uh, we squeeze this ICA and then we wait for 20 minutes and then we see the video. And then we see, we ask the patient to wiggle his leg or the hand. And then if he's fine and able to do the movements, we ligate it immediately. This is how we work here because all places doesn't have the facility of a balloon angioplasty. So this is a cheaper way of achieving this. So let's come to the specific sites and I'll talk about the complications in the specific sites, what we encountered. In IC aneurysm, giant or large, the indication remains where the anterior carotid artery cannot be saved or where there are lenticular striate arteries which cannot be saved from, which are arising from either the MC or ACA in the giant aneurysm. Okay. Here we do a high flow ECIC bypass. And so now I will show this particular case. You see, this was a case who presented with sudden onset headache. And also partial process was there. You can see giant PCA, PCOM aneurysm, and also an aneurysm arising from the medial side, probably a superior hypophysia. So, okay. So, actually, we th the plan as we went in was to do an a, a, in anterior drilling, and probably we thought we'll be able to tackle the aneurysm, though we kept a control in the neck. But as we opened and we found that it was impossible to do anterior drilling because the other aneurysm, which was the unruptured one, was just glaring at you. So we had to first uh, clip the unruptured one, and then only we could manage to see the PCOM one, which we could subsequently dissect and clip and save the PCOM, and that it was a, a good recovery in a patient. Uh, if I could. And uh, so this is one case that was that went on well, and this was a case where we had to do, this was a large uh, PCOM artery where we it had to do a repositioning within six hours of surgery. If I, it is an old video, and if you see it here, you can see an atheromatous snack. We used a fenestrated clip and, and done it. And here we could see we did not have an ICG or anything there, and we could see physically that the endocarioidal was good enough, so we came. But on reversal from anesthesia, the patient developed right hemiplegia. We just took him in and again clip adjusted. So this tells us a story that. If you do not have an ICG to confirm, you may end up going to the theater again, even though it looks good, but then uh, you know you need the ICG to confirm when it is available. So this is another complication I would like to say that this is a right PCOM aneurysm replied on 24 day of clipping. I'll say this is not a giant one, but I wanted to show this complication, so I included in this presentation. This is the first angio pre-clipping. And then on the 24th day, she came with the GCS7, and this was the CT scan. So when we did an angio, we could see that the clip has actually slipped from the aneurysm. She was re-clipped. So this could also happen. Now, this is another complication of a giant IC aneurysm which actually gave way when we were doing an anterior clinoid drilling. I will just go, I will my, just go a little bit, hurry up through the clinoidal drilling part. I could not edit much because, so as we were drilling, you can see it was a huge aneurysm. Unfortunately, I did not put the scans because most of them looked alike actually huge lobulated ones. You can see that we are doing the drilling here. The drilling continues. The, and this is the whole aneurysm. We tried to do a retrograde suction this, uh, decompression, but then it gave away and there was tremendous amount of bleeding. We had no other option but to go on putting stacking fenestrated clips. And we required almost six uh, fenestrated clips to tackle this huge aneurysm. But, at, but anyway, we could manage it. So what, did the, what is the solution or what is the moral we learned from this story? So the moral is, if you do not have a balloon in the ICA while clipping as a control, 
then you may end up with such problems. So a good meticulous planning is always required when you deal with such things like that. If you have a balloon here, you could do the suction. This is also another way of doing a suction decompression, but this is the easier way. And uh, it, uh, this is how we do when that is not available. So coming to that, and if you see the sodium fluorescence of that particular case, you can see there was a good distal flow, so the patient came out well. Now coming to an, uh, MC aneurysm, when do you do an MC aneurysm? When there is a fusiform aneurysm encircling the M1 flow diverters as a risk of thrombosis of the perforating vessels and two branches arising from aneurysm set, reconstruction time and clipping time can be prolonged if a bypass is there. You, if we know that STMC bypass, uh, around 100 ml is given if uh, uh, circulation time is given with a good size SCA. However, the MCA tater requires around 75 ml. And if you do a double bypass, it almost supports the whole hemisphere, as I have told earlier, because it gives around 150 ml per minute. So this is one case of a 23-year-old male who had a sudden onset of right hemiparesis, regained completely by 10 days, was investigated outside with a CT scan and came to us with occasional headache. And these were his scans where you can see a giant aneurysm of the MC bifurcation. It was an irregular shaped aneurysm. And we uh, went and we did an ECIC bypass in this case and tracked the aneurysm. But the Immediate post op patient had a right hemiparesis up to the tune of three by five, and he worsened aphasia and worsening of hemiparesis happened on period day four, and we had to do a decompressive craniotomy. But the aphasia improved, the neurological improved completely over three months, and now he's almost near normal, and uh, he's about to do his all his activities well. So this was the post trapping aneurysm. You can see the aneurysm is gone but uh, had a stormy, stormy post-operative period. Now, this is a gentleman, a 65-year-old man. He was, he was uh, cir uh, circulation-wise, he was not a very good candidate. He had a cardiac stent one year back. Ejection fraction was 30. He went to the airport to receive his newborn granddaughter arriving from uh, US and, you know, he fell down and collapsed. And uh, then this was the scan with which he came to us. We had to do an emergency decompressive craniotomy. So this was how the aneurysm was looking and this was how the angiogram looked. So we told them we'd go for endovascular. We always have a problem with finances for this huge cost and many times we have to curtail our indications and uh, the treatment we can offer because of this logistic reasons as well. And this was one such case. And they said that, no, whatever is the risk, we can go ahead for surgery. So while decompressing, we took up and we did a bypass and then we clipped both the, I mean, we did trap ligation of both the fusiform um, part and then patient did well, but unfortunately bypass was what happened on the post-op. The day one, he had a massive MI and we could not uh, keep him with us. He left us. This is one very interesting case. I would like to show that this was a case of, again, I did not put up the pictures of too many things were coming of the same type, the MCA large and, and a giant aneurysm. And the plan was to go in, trap it after doing an STMCA bypass. So when we went in and we found that, uh, when we went in and we found that it was dissectable and we could, we could find the proximal part MCA and we could also find the distal part, so what we did is we put clips on both, trapped it, and uh, we trapped it, and we put some ICG, and you can see that even after putting both the clips, the ICG was filling. There was a good flow of the distal vessels and perfusion. So at the point of time, we decided that bypass is probably not required in this case because the filling was good enough. So we went ahead and we just dealt with the aneurysm, dissected it completely, and then of course, uh, we had to reduce the mass effect. So what was done was uh, the aneurysm was torn apart, the, all the tremors were taken out, and uh, the whole aneurysm was collapsed, and the simple clip was put in the mouth. So many a times in giant aneurysm, you know, you plan something and you may end up doing something else on the operative table. And that's the importance that you need to gather more and more experience in this type of cases. So now coming to the enters, ECS segment, take home segment, giant aneurysms are highly, it's a highly complex region, we all know. Delta aneurysms are either fusiform or giant 
the ones are really difficult one. And the treatment modality here could be a side-to-side uh, -side A3, A3 bypass. I'll just show you a case which where, you know, there is a was problem in the decision making. This was the patient who came to us with the subarachnoid hemorrhage and this showed a proximal duct aneurysm. It was a giant aneurysm. So we went ahead, we planned for an A3, A3 bypass and then uh, do the surgery. But on opening, what we found as we were going through the interhemispheric fissure, we found that the, the video is an old one. I'm sorry for the poor quality. And uh, uh, both the ACs were found. And then we saw that there were a lot of collaterals which has already developed and which are arising from the right ACA and going to the left side. And so at that point of time, we felt that it was not required to do a bypass because collaterals were already abundantly there. So we went ahead, dissected the aneurysm, trapped it, opened it, and once again, thrombectomy and everything, blah, blah, and everything went fine. But the problem in this case, why I like to share is that there was no big complication as such, but the decision making, we just rushed it and did the surgery with a CT scan. Always we should do an MRI. The size of the aneurysm was two times bigger than what was shown on the scan in the angiogram because that is the filling part. The thrombus part was, is not shown until you do an MRI, you don't see it. So I missed that part and that's why I thought that I need to put it up here to emphasize the fact that we always need to do an MRI in a giant aneurysm to see what is the thrombus part and what is the circulating, I mean, blood part because that's how you know the size of the aneurysm while really you are operating on them. So that was the lesson learned from this case. And now, then this was a duct aneurysm where the neck ruptured. So this is the point where if you know microvascular anastomosis, it helps you. The neck ruptured while doing the aneurysm and um, the, this was a borrowed slide from one of my, from my mentor. And then, you know, that was, that is where you take a tenon nylon and you clip it and you suture the rupt, the ruptured part and you can get away at times with it. You can see we are suturing, the neck is being sutured after putting a clip as it was bleeding and then it sufficed. And then the clips were readjusted more and more in this case till we got the appropriate thing. And uh, the drama never ended here. It went on and then as I just go through because you know these are some of the dissection time the clip was manipulated. We had to figure out which would be the best position of the clip. We did that, and uh, now you see as you remove the clip, it again started bleeding. Again, few switches were given, and finally it could be tackled. So you have to keep all the things handy at time in whatever you need. You need to do at the point of time. So it's a dynamic thinking process which requires in the surgeries for giant aneurysm, I think. So we could get away nicely with this particular case as well. So let's come to the posterior circulation aneurysm, ideally endovascular. V3 pica, you usually get a fusiform learn larger giant pica pica bypass is recommended or an occipital artery pica bypass. Usually occlusion distal to telovelot on cellular segment is very well tolerated. And then I will show this very interesting case of a 33-year-old female who was diabetic, hypothyroid, had sudden onset severe headache, again headache, two ictus came to us with GCS5, it was a downgate fix, um, palsy was there, and there was a sluggishly reacting pupils with no focal motor deficient. And this was the scan, admitting scan, and so we did a pre bar hole and ventricular stony and a draining and it kept managed in IC, got better over time and the angio showed a V4 segment aneurysm with the spas I mean spasm segments in almost all the major vessels. So she gradually improved and the uh, endovascular team said was not favorable for intervention. So we planned for a surgery and this was just before surgery. The scan looks pretty good and then after that we did a left or lateral approach and the biker was incorpororated that thing two so, more minutes okay Dr. Sitanga, two more minutes yeah so this was the artery and uh, you can see we did we put a doppler in and then um, we saw that it was filling so we had to put an additional clip and after that uh, we could do an ic and we saw the biker was patent so we could get but 
she did not she did well and on the 10th day she had some reserve csf leak we put a lumbar drain she was she vomited one fine day in the morning and then we saw that she had a massive infarct and of course we could not sell it so this was another case with the swelling in the uh, neck she had difficulty in the swelling and this was the aneurysm they did not go for they had any no financials problem Sorry. And so we had to do uh, this one bypass and plan for a proximal ligation of the ICA. But on the post post of as we were willing her, she deteriorated and we had a repopulation. So we should uh, be very careful in choosing our approaches because too much is also bad. And you see that she landed up with this. And finally, she succumbed with this. So this is our series of uh, this one, 21 operated, several. And uh, these are some examples. I'll just skip to them in view of time. So with this, I would like to say that we had a good outcome in 80% of fresh patient and it's always a learning experience with all the failures which we come and across away. And uh, the, this is the outcome with IC, MC, DACA and post circulation. And in conclusion, I would like to say that what complications we can expect are is an intraoperative rupture or a post-operative, we can have an ischemia or infarct or a repercussion injury, as I have shown in the case examples. And what are the tools to avoid injury are ICG or sodium fluorescent guided surgery is better, bypass giving circulation and prolonging clip time, and endovascular are getting better by the day. So actually, that is the thing. So I leave for you all to decide what is to be done in this case. This is a case of 70-year-old the left become clipped four years back right now admitted with us and on both the sides she has huge aneurysms on both the sides and uh, endovascular people said that is a very tortuous and probably will not be able to put a flow diverter here so we plan for approximate ligation following a bypass so with this i thank you all for hearing me and uh, uh, i hope it was useful to you all thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Suchanda, for this beautiful lecture. And it is quite a good series of uh, giant aneurysms that you have. And uh, it's quite nice to see that a lot of bypasses are being done in this era of flow diverter. Uh, do, we, do we have any questions for Dr. Suchanda? We are blessed because, you know, endovascular, many people cannot afford, so we have this option in hand. <laughs> I'm doing both, so I should not say too much, I think. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm uh, okay. uh, sorry. Yeah. Do we have any questions, or should we move uh, on to the next? Yeah. I'm very impressed. Can I? Can I? Yes. Yes. Yes, oh, Doctor. Yeah. I'm very impressed by the series because, I mean, it's a great series and also the outcome is very good. 80% of the cases that were and you have adjusted four cases that died basically. So it's a very good series. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, to Dr. Suchanda. We'll move on. If anyone has any questions, they can put it on the chat later on. So we'll move on to our next presentation. I invite Dr. Rosanna Romani from the yes. UK. Uh, she is an associate professor of neurosurgery. She's from Helsinki. She's a consultant neurosurgeon in Finland and Italy. And currently she's doing a fellowship in Southampton. And she's going to present to us a complications in posterior annual circulation aneurysm clipping. So, Dr. Rosanna, you can start sharing your screen now. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. And uh, yeah, try. I, I'm, uh, I had a problem yesterday with my computer. I want just to say to the audience, and I'm doing my presentation. I did uh, this presentation last night with my mobile iPhone. So, hope that it works well. And one yes. of the videos is uh, from our, one of my friends uh, from USA. Um, I go with iCloud. <clears throat> Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Um, so I must say that this is a very difficult presentation nowadays because the posterior circulation aneurysm, as you know, are um, best treated with the endovascular route. And uh, um, especially in UK, the first choice for the 
treatment of the all aneurysm actually is at the endovascular root. We have the chance still to do uh, many anterior circulation aneurysm by surge open surgery, uh, but uh, definitely the posterior circulation uh, go to the to the endovascular people and. Uh, um, so we have just a few cases. So when we talk about complication, definitely we need to um, to consider the patient factor, analyst factor, and surgeon factor. So when when I I, I think about the patient factor, especially in UK, we have a very um, good selection of the patient, especially for surgery, but for all treatment. Uh, I'm, uh, as I said, I train in nursing with Professor Ernest Niemi, and I feel very privileged to have learned the macrosurgical technique with him. Uh, in Helsinki, uh, both the center, Copio and Helsinki, had an experience of more than 13,000 of macrosurgical uh, operation, uh, especially in Helsinki, uh, since the 60s, they were treated 10,000 uh, um, patients by macrosurgery. So we, when I was there, we were doing majority of the cases, more than 90% by open surgery. And I had the chance to learn as well the posterior circulation microsurgery technique, which nowadays in UK, for example, is very seldom to be seen. Uh, but uh, in Helsinki, the selection of the patient was very poor, I have to say, so all peer patients were treated. In UK, we are very careful. So the age of the patient, but especially the health status of the patient. So if the patient is living in a nursing home and has a grade 5 subarachnoid hemorrhage, of course it's not treated. But the patient with independent living and with, um, even if old, of as, as a good chance that we give the chance and this is treated by endovascular people or eventually if they cannot, we do the open surgery. So when I talk of uh, posterior circulation aneurysm, we cannot deny that the most experienced neurosurgeons in the world are these three people. And Professor Drake experience by publishing his book in 1996 of 1,767 patients is an experience that I think nowadays nobody will have anymore. Uh, Professor Nesniemi learned by Professor Drake and uh, he reviewed his surgical technique and his uh, pitfall about posterior circulation aneurysm. But what they concluded in their book is that a complicated course of recovery was more common than not. And you can see us how even the most experienced hand, the posterior circulation aneurysm have a lot of complication. Um, when I was in Helsinki, uh, I had uh, the chance to do uh, um, a, uh, to, to, to do many publications, and especially in microsurgical technique, because we were doing uh, open surgery uh, all the time. And uh, I published this chapter about the uh, microsurgery of rupture aneurysm. This is a few, few years ago in the Bandock uh, book from the uh, Northwest uh, in, uh, in Chicago. And uh, you can see uh, in this book, we uh, described all the technique uh, for uh, rupture aneurysm of the anterior and posterior circulation and if you if you any one of you wish to have this book of course i'm happy to email you and you can find in youtube all the uh, videos with the, uh, the description and uh, the different surgical approach you know uh, in Helsinki we are very minimally in minimal approach we were doing we is for anterior and as well for posterior circulation Skull-based surgeries was really reserved to very complex cases and in seldom aneurysm. Otherwise, we were most likely doing, for all cases, a very small approach. And you can see this, uh, all the technique in this book. We also publish later on, and I contribute as well in the chapter of this uh, Intracranial aneurysm, where we review in non rupture aneurysm our technique. Uh, but uh, because uh, nowadays the posterior circulation aneurysm are treated mainly um, by the endovascular people, I thought that uh, in this presentation probably could be useful to see as well to review one of the 
basically macrosurgical technique for those previously coiled aneurysm. So I just analyzed the the posterior circulation. We had in this series of 81 patients uh, with 82 aneurysms, uh, 24 posterior circulation aneurysms. And uh, um, what is really, uh, I think, uh, significant is that uh, by analyzing the fact correlated with the outcome, we found that the posterior location, intraoperative rupture, and temporary clipping were associated with a poor outcome. And of these 24 uh, posterior circulation aneurysm, four patients died, one patient had severe disability, and one was in persistent vegetative status. So these patients were treated, the complex cases treated by uh, the best neurosurgeon, but still with a lot of complication, as Professor Drake already wrote and described in his microsurgical technique. Uh, Dr. Bennett, do you want to run out the video, please? Hello? Uh, yes, I'll do it right now, okay? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, I'm gonna I... stop your screen sharing momentarily, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to share the video now, okay? Yeah, I'm very grateful to Dr. Lanzino from the Neurosurgical Department of Mayo Clinic in Rochester, who uh, gave me this video, uh, which described the, the macrosurgical technique we use in Helsinki. Okay, here uh, we go. Here yeah, we go. please. Okay. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. If you can put the whole screen, thank you. So this, uh, um, this video, as I said, describes the subtemporal approach for one of giant basilar uh, tip aneurysm. Uh, it's a video uh, very didactic and the quality is extremely good. Uh, and as I said, all of my videos uh, uh, for this publication are online on YouTube and uh, my computer, unfortunately, stopped work last yesterday so i couldn't unfortunately upload but uh, uh, you can uh, you can uh, uh, see the quality is really good so this is a 46 year old lady and uh, came to the attention of the local doctor because of the cognitive deterioration you can see this giant aneurysm uh, the dsa show uh, the flow inside and then uh, you can see as well from uh, it's going uh, from the carotid injection of the posterior communicating artery is uh, very big a posterior communicating artery which uh, um, it's very important for later on when uh, for the surgical um, for the surgical plan uh, so basically this uh, patient which is just an example um, with a giant aneurysm, um, couldn't be treated by a surgery in, in, in by endovascular, sorry, by endovascular uh, root, and this mainly because of the perforator of the, um, of the tip of the uh, basilar region. And uh, also, I have to say that many times when there are large or giant aneurysm, the endovascular route is not really the ideal because there is a lot of swelling after the coiling with the brainstem compression and many patients deteriorate because of that. So uh, in this case, the, the Dr. Lanzino made, of course, a, a occlusion test from the left vertebral artery. This is to verify the flow from the perforator, which is extremely important when uh, it's plans, uh, it's, it, we need to plan a proximal occlusion of the basilar, which is the best treatment in this kind of giant aneurysm. Um, so the surgical approach for this kind of, uh, is it the same that we use in Helsinki and it should be used, so the subtemporal approach, which is a very direct approach. Uh, and it's, uh, um, it's a very, very, um, 
anatomical approach, as you know. So the patient is in lateral position and usually the head needs to be parallel to the floor and a little bit tilted to the down. And it's extremely important, the lumbar drain. So uh, I remember that uh, we never did a posterior circulation subtemporal approach without the lumbar drain. And I have to say that in Helsinki, we had also uh, a very good anesthetic team and always the brain was slack. This is extremely important when you do a small approach, a small craniotomy, because a slack brain is the key. So of course, sometimes when you don't have the slack brain, you need to do a larger approach. But uh, when the anesthetic team is extremely good and we published many articles about the technique of the anesthesia, uh, then uh, the, the approach for skull-based lesion or for vascular lesion uh, can be small and as you know we are uh, we, we publish many articles about the lateral supraorbital approach for anterior circulation or for anterior skull base lesion um, then uh, what is a key in the subtemporal approach uh, you are all of the panelists I can see are very experienced in neurosurgeons so you know that the tentorial age it's uh, uh, the one that needs to be open to gain uh, the, uh, enough access to the proximal portion of the basilar artery and also to expose the anatomy, uh, which is a very uh, eloquent anatomy. Um, and uh, here are all the steps that are described in a didactic way. So the, the, the um, as, as you can see, and then basically the, the uh, the uh, visualization of the oculomotor, the trochlear nerve, superior cerebellar artery, that you can see now in the video, or all the structure. So the tentorial edge, uh, the opening of the um, uh, interpeduncular cistern with uh, uh, sharp bipolar we uh, usually uh, i have to say that we will always alternating the bipolar uh, as a microsurgical technique in um, and and we do as well here in uk so uh, the sharp bipolar usually as the section but uh, many times we use the blunt bipolar to avoid uh, um, to the, to avoid uh, basically the, da the damage of the structure and you can see here now the uh, superior cerebellar artery which is uh, exposed i can't really the video is very uh, the brain stem with the star um, yeah the dissection of course of the still the arachnoid and then uh, the uh, exposure of the oculometer Mm. But now the difference is when we open the tentorial edge. For this approach, it's mandatory to open the tentorial edge. So we usually use the clip to uh, hold the, the tentorial edge. But if you are not familiar with that, of course, the suture is absolutely fine. And actually, here, Dr. Lanzina used the, the suture. Um, you can see here now the exposure of the giant aneurysm and then the superior cerebellar artery and then there is just the proximal, I mean just a small part of the basilar distal portion which is exposed but when you open the tentorial then this is evident. Yeah, we usually found the trochlear nerve. Uh, Yes, and then the, the opening of the tentorial age. So I'm saying that if you're familiar most with the suture, that's fine. You can use the suture for the tentorial age, but otherwise the clip is much faster, is much practical. Sometimes when you put the clip, there is a small bleeding from the tentorial, but it's a, it's a, that's not really a big problem because you can put as well as fibrin glue to stop this uh, this uh, suture this uh, sorry this bleeding uh, in the in, when you do the suture of course this is uh, uh, usually does not happen but if it's happened you can use as well fibrin glue and this is uh, the difference of the exposure you can see the basilar uh, this that part of the basilar which is in this case extremely important for the proximal clipping is very well exposed now um, And now the dissection of the perforator before the clipping. 
Um, if you don't have the ICG uh, video angiography, so the endocinin, uh, then you can use the Doppler, of course. Uh, but the ICG is extremely useful. Uh, you can see as well the pituitary stock now on the left of the surgical field exposed. Um, yes, now the arrow there. And this is the posterior clinoid. So uh, why not to do the subtemporal approach in basal RT panerism? Usually when you have uh, an aneurysm who is, which is uh, uh, quite uh, below the posterior, or the at the level of the posterior clinoid, but if it's the aneurysm over the posterior clinoid, usually one centimeter, then you can do the pterional approach. Uh, or uh, yes, the anterior approach, the anterior approach. We mm, usually never uh, use, unless that is giant aneurysm, uh, but, uh, but uh, for small aneurysm, even lateral suprapedal approach is enough, uh, or just a small uh, uh, exposure of uh, the tem temporal side, uh, but you don't need a really a large pterion because you can reach the posterior clinoid and the uh, posterior circulation even with, uh, with this uh, uh, small approach and of course with the good anesthetic tool. This is the uh, ICG showing the clip, the uh, superior cerebellar artery and then as well the basilar. So unfortunately, this patient, so the patient went very well. Now it's, uh, mm, you can see, uh, it's very slow, but it's very, very, very good video. The quality is very good, I have to say. Mm. Um, so this patient uh, immediately after surgery had a very, I mean, she was unchanged. On, you can see here the DSA after surgery, which shows still the aneurysm, but the flow was much reduced. Uh, and you can see here in the posterior, which there is. This was for the uh, anterior injection, and then now the posterior. But the posterior, the postoperative cause of the patient was basically unchanged with the same symptoms as before surgery. Um, but then uh, uh, later on, this this was started very aspirin by the a colleague from the um, from Rochester, and then uh, uh, she had as well a post-operative MRI. This after one month, where showed already initial thrombosis of the giant aneurysm. Um, this was one month later on. So later on, the patient uh, um, uh, started to have uh, uh, urinary incontinence and also get uh, worsening. This is uh, uh, two months after the neurosurgical procedure. Dr. Rosanna, just a reminder, you have two more minutes. Yes, I finished now, don't worry. And uh, uh, unfortunately, she was found unconscious, and then uh, she uh, basically uh, there was the plan to review the patient to exclude hydrocephalus because this probably was the, the, the cause of the deterioration or maybe a sudden rupture of the aneurysm. If you can come back, I don't know, to the slide, I have just the Dr. Joel. Yes, yes, you want to uh, go back? I don't know if I can. Can I go? Yeah, you want to go back in your presentation there? Oh, wait a minute yeah. here. We, yeah, yeah. So the presentation there is just one slide. Uh, okay. Can which, I can, yes. Or maybe I can go by myself, maybe. Yeah, let me get off the screen share. Okay, it's all yours now. Yeah, it's just a yeah. yeah. So uh Basically, uh, I think a giant aneurysm, I agree with the previous presentation, they should be treated with uh, yeah, proximal occlusion or with uh, bypass. I think it's a multidisciplinary uh, surgical planning or treatment plan. And uh, there are no secrets to success. It's the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. And we had many complications about this aneurysm, especially in posterior circulation. We, in our experience, with the best microsurgical skills, still we have very, very, uh, I mean, the outcome is poor, I have to say. So we needed to uh, 
probably uh, yeah bypass bypass a simple bypass for future and uh, uh, still are very challenging lesion with uh, associated with a lot of complication thank you very much and i'm so sorry for the presentation from my mobile i couldn't uh, <laughs> i'm sorry really for that yeah. but uh, no, no, it no, was no, really I, 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 I didn't know plan this <laughs> Um, no thank you, thank you very much for the chance. It's, I really feel very, very honored to give this talk uh, to mm, all this experienced neurosurgeon <laughs> around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosanna. That was a good, great presentation. And uh, you have, you have, you, you must have seen a lot of posterior aneurysm surgery because of your experience in Helsinki, which we don't yes. see too, you know, we don't see too much in this endovascular era. There was a Correct. great presentation. Yeah. So it, it's an art probably that we should also be aware of and we should train to at least learn to clip some posterior circulation aneurysms, right? I think this video are nowadays the way we could learn because I think because we don't have any more the you know, they really every day we cannot see this microsurgical technique. But this video, which for example, this video uh, is exactly the technique we were using in Helsinki. So it's exactly the same approach, what we do, and we can learn about the YouTube you know, video, this kind of way to do surgery, because that's the way today, I think, to learn. We can't really, uh, and, and if you, we have the skills, so we are vascular neurosurgeons, so we have the skills, we know how to open the, the you know, the arachnoid or to dissect the perforator, we just, uh, and, and we can do that, we can do, it. it's not really, and this video are available for everybody, so Ernest Yemi published more than 1,000 video, and uh, all of my video, and if you need some material, uh, article, so chapter, all the techniques is described, so we can do that. And even if they are not every day, unfortunately, nowadays, so we can't see anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So thank you, Dr. Rosanna. Do we have any questions for her? Okay, I think you can post the questions on the chat and we'll move ahead. Uh, we with Dr. Yoshimura, he is with us. He is, uh, can I invite Dr. Shinji Yoshimara? He's professor and chair department of neurosurgery at the Hugo College of Medicine in Japan. And he will be talking to us about uh, complications in endovascular intervention. He does a lot of interventional neuro, neuro radiology and he will be showing his presentation now. Dr. Shinichi. Okay, do you see it? Yes. yes Hi. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm, it's a great honor for me to present our experience of the endovascular therapy for large or giant aneurysms. Okay. Oh. Uh, this is our college uh, named the Hyogo College of Medicine. It is at Nishinomiya. Where is Nishinomiya? It is uh, close to Osaka. Uh, it's actually between Osaka and Kobe. Here is our institute. This is my personal experience of the uh, treatment as a neurosurgeon. Uh, my total case is over 5,000 5, and uh, uh, among them more than 2,000 cases are uh, aneurysm treatment. The number of treatment of cerebral aneurysm is increasing by year like this. And in my department, open surgery is done in around 40% of the patient and endovascular therapy is in 60% of the patient according to the patient aneurysm uh, anatomy and systemic uh, condition. Uh, endovascular therapy was performed more than 500 people uh, in five years, and the percentage of coiling is 44, stent assist coiling is 41, and flow diverter was used in 15%. This is a, a summary of clinical result of our uh, uh, aneurysm treatment for unruptured one from 2016 and the bus in endovascular therapy group 
we experienced uh, a complication in 2.5 percent it is not so much but look at this uh, this is a summary of complication in endovascular therapy for cerebral aneurysm among these five patients all were in large or giant aneurysm and among them this is a very light mild complication uh, double vision worsening but the other one hemorrhage 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 and this is might be due to rupture of the aneurysm i guess it is uh, one month after the procedure the timing was uh, one one day one week three week and one month so um, complication in large or giant aneurysm done by endovascular therapy were mainly due to hemorrhage. So, oh, you know, pipeline is a major device as a flow diverter for cerebral aneurysm. It is most frequently used in the world. And uh, please uh, look at this animation. Uh, most of, of you already saw this animation. Uh, if aneurysm is located at the paracurinal portion, uh, this device is very effective, like this. Just deploy in the parent artery. That's it. It's so easy. It's so simple. It can be done under local anesthesia. Actually, my main series of the pipeline is um, done by, done under uh, local anesthesia, the aneurysm shrinks like this. So this is a typical case, uh, 55 years old male showing visual disturbance. And this patient was actually a medical doctor, radiologist. He noticed left visual disturbance and he, his own, <laughs> he did his own MRI and uh, diagnosis who knows his uh, aneurysm like this, supracellular mass lesion was detected. And he came to me and uh, he showed this MRA and the maximum size was uh, more than 15 millimeters. So he already investigated the publication and requested me to, to perform a prodiabetic treatment without coiling, okay, because of the better uh, visual uh, acuity improvement. So I followed his uh, request, just deployed a single pipeline like this under local anesthesia. And this is just after the treatment. And six months later, aneurysm size is smaller than the just after one. And nine months later, aneurysm was gone on MRA and the visual disturbance was completely improved. This is a follow-up angiography, a pre and after the treatment, six, uh, nine months later, look at this, aneurysm completely disappeared. But we experienced serious complication in this 74 years female. She had a progressive visual field defect like this, Left eye was almost blind, and right as eyes uh, visual field was uh, uh, getting smaller. And the previous surgeon just the aneurysm was uncreepable because the IC perforator were running along the aneurysm wall. So we thought that uh, what kind of options are available for or her uh, creeping parent artery occlusion with or without bypass. A flow diverter with coiling or flow diverter only. We had a big discussion with that and uh, perforator adherence to the aneurysm wall or uh, made difficult uh, creeping. Okay, risk of anterior corridor artery thrombosis due to hypoplastic PICO. We uh, we gave up to perform a, a high flow bypass plus parent artery occlusion, and uh, I think. This method, 
screwdriver uh, plus coiling might be better uh, in terms of delayed to prevent delayed rupture. But the patient and the patient family strongly requested to perform um, screwdriver treatment only without coiling. So we followed again this method. Uh, this is a, a movie of screwdriver uh, deployment for her aneurysm. Okay. It was very difficult to navigate the microcassette uh, to M1 portion. We went around the aneurysm like this, and we inserted another catheter to embolize the aneurysm, okay, in case of uh, something happens. And we connected three flow diverters, three. It's very expensive treatment, but I could manage to deploy three stents. Look at this, contrast media, uh, was uh, stable in the aneurysm. So we are so happy with that, but it was suddenly disconnected. So now we navigate the microcassette uh, through the disconnected to stand like this. Now I explain like this. This is uh, just after deployment of three, uh, no, sorry, two flow Look at this. This deployed very well, seems to be well, but it gradually uh, shrinked and uh, disconnected. Okay, so I navigate the microcassette between these two stents and connect it like this. So we, uh, we were happy with that and uh, uh, start to select the additional pipeline, but anesthesiologist reported blood pressure elevated gradually. We requested to lower it, but the pressure was still elevating. So I felt strange and did angiography and look at this. ICA was occluded maybe due to the thrombosis, but contralateral angiography showed the actually Elevating the intracranial pressure, it means uh, aneurysm ruptured during the procedure. So we immediately embolized the aneurysm and the uh, ICA itself. Fortunately, there was a uh, uh, little communication from the uh, contralateral A1 side, but finally we lost this patient. So what was the cause of rupture? It ruptured during selection of flow diverter. We didn't touch the patient at the time. So maybe compression of the aneurysm wall by the catheter or the aneurysm wall was injured by an edge of disconnected flow diverter during insertion of microcatheter or flow stress by turbulent flow by disconnection of flow diverter cause rupture. Who knows? But maybe one of them. So we tried to uh, fix our method. Short course of deployment is better. So sometimes we have to go around in the aneurysm to navigate the microcatheter, and we try to deploy like this, but it causes rupture. So we have to we have to go around the aneurysm sometimes, but we have to straighten the catheter by inflation of balloon or something, and deploy stent like straightly. This is the ideal method. But sometimes it is not easy. Go around the aneurysm, pull the catheter, and try to deploy stent, but it may sometimes uh, need two or three chlorodiverter. It lead to migration of the stent system like this. So we saw that uh, this method, okay? Uh, straighten the microcatheter, and af after straightening, we embolize the aneurysm, and by this anchoring, we could deploy pipeline like this. So it is the best one like this, okay? You saw, but if it, it is very difficult to like this. We have to deploy coil and uh, flow diverter. But mass effect may 
remain. But in this 80 years old female showing hyperpituitarism and the visual field defect, we did the front two. Okay? Patient had uh, such a giant aneurysm, and we, de we delivered coils like this. And this is just after coiling. Afterward, we deployed pipeline like this. So aneurysm was completely obliterated during follow-up. But he, her visual acuity was not recovered, but we saved her life. So aneurysms difficult to treat by flow diverter I are as follows. First one is a tortuous access route. Okay? Navigation of guiding or microcatheter is difficult. Giant aneurysm. Complication rate is reported to be higher compared to large aneurysm or smaller one. Fujiform or aneurysm having branch from the dome. There is a risk of thrombosis in branches and perforators. Maybe this is uh, maybe a basilar trunk aneurysm or M aneurysm. Ruptured aneurysm in acute phase is not flow diverter is not reimbursed in your country. Delayed rupture may happen. And hemorrhage, if patient having hemorrhagic disease like gastrointestinal or women's disease like uh, uh, uterus myoma or something, antiplatelet may cause a hemorrhagic problem. So we cannot administer it. So it is not good for the uh, pipeline treatment. So our experience of pipeline is uh, now 100, but uh, in 90 patients, we experienced a this serious rupture. And another one is uh, worsening of um, um policy. So basically, the uh, treatment is safe, but we have to carefully select the patient. So recently, endovascular therapy is rapidly increasing, and many patients request it. However, we should select a surgical method when it is safer due to patient anatomical and systemic condition. Okay, this is extra appendix. Annual trend of cerebral annual treatment in Japan. Okay, rupture, creeping for rupture, unrupture are decreasing, and both unruptured or unruptured endovascular therapy are increasing like this, it is almost the same within uh, two or three years, okay? 10 or 20 years ago, it was like this. Surgery and endovascular therapy was like this. However, now it is like this, okay? So it's time to shake hands. Maybe it, now it is time to be a hybrid neurosurgeon like us and to do uh, endovascular therapy and surgery. So I'm always saying to the young fellow, why don't you start endovascular therapy together with uh, surgery? Is it possible? Uh, nothing is impossible to achieve. Okay, we have actually uh, many overseas trainees and visitors like, like this. We are so happy. They are from Indonesia, India, Nepal, Vietnam, Colombia, Nepal, Thailand, and also even from Nigeria. We are happy with them, okay? Uh, we, uh, we are proud to be a WFNS postgraduate training center. And uh, hopefully uh, we, we can see you, young fellow, in Osaka or maybe in Kobe, uh, Kobe B is waiting for you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yoshimura. That was Hi. an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, th you spoke about hybrid neurosurgeons and it is becoming a very important armamentarium. I think young neurosurgeons should train in both open and endovascular because Thank then you. you have the option of selecting the right treatment for your patient, you know, the aneurysm morphology, and then you're able to select oh. the right kind of treatment for all your patients.
uh, we in our department also do both even i am trained in both open and endovascular neurosurgery oh. and to say the least flow diverters are a good option but yes complications can happen even right. i have seen one uh, where we had a supracranoid huge ic aneurysm and the patient did well for 3 days after deployment of flow diverter but then suddenly on the third day i uh, she didn't she succumbed and we did an autopsy and we could see that the flow diverter had come out of the vessel i mean the whole oh. aneurysm had ruptured yeah so i have mm. seen one complication of a flow diverter but otherwise okay. they are pretty good uh, tools and they do well so thank you oh. dr yushkara thank Any you thank you everybody Do we have any questions? Yeah, actually, I have a question, if it's possible, oh. if you have a time. Yes, go ahead, go oh. ahead, Dr. Rosanna. Yeah. No, I'm just impressed by the fact that you did 67 cases under local anesthesia. Ah. <laughs> I mean, this is yeah. uh, the first time, first time that I, I, to be honest, I heard that, I mean, the stand, uh, you know, in session, because usually they are under general anesthesia, so. Oh, really? Uh -huh. yes, yeah, yes. we do under general, to be honest, yeah, in uh, the department where... Um, Japanese so you... patient is so, so still. tough. <laughs> <laughs> so still, because... <laughs> and do you, do you do also the double uh, anticoagulant treatment for yes. uh, the oh. aspirin for life, and then uh, what do you yeah. use? Usually? Yeah, right. Right. A key Asking point is uh, to test the uh, antiplatelet uh, reaction of the patient ah. before mm -hmm. the procedure, because Asian shows a higher percentage of the resistance to the clopidogrel, right? So in that case, we switched to the recently new uh, uh, uh medicine like prasugrel or some other. Prasugrel. And then yeah. you do prasugrel for six weeks or for uh, six months, how much do you usually earn? The, how long do you? Uh, usually one to three months, we will stop prasugrel and continue aspirin. For life. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Beautiful presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, so we'll move on to our next presentation. And I have the pleasure to invite Dr. Eka Vajikramano. Uh, he's a very eminent neurosurgeon. He's one of the foremost neurosurgeons of Indonesia with a very special interest in brainstem, regions of the brainstem. And he's, going, he's uh, the head of neurosurgical department at Siloam Hospital in Indonesia. And he's going to talk to us about complications in brainstem cavernous. Cavernoma surgery. Dr. Eka? Abhidya. Yes. Be a screen share now. Yeah. Okay. You, you see my screen? Yes. Yes, I've started. yes, I see your screen. You see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So, hello, everybody. I'm Eka from Indonesia. I just want to share with you about our experience in brainstem cavernoma surgery and the title this uh, this time is the complication so uh, as you know that brainstem is on this because your tome and everything is there nuclear track everything is there so of course uh, many probabilities of complication if we have, a, for instance, not a proper approach for that. So let me share with you about a couple of cases we have. So this is termination. Everybody knows that it is like a neoplastic because of the head behavior, mostly in a, in a mucosa and mostly in the pons. This is our experience in uh, doing cavernous uh, angioma brainstem uh, 60 cases. So, uh, what is the typical surgery of the brainstem cavernoma? Besides, we need to know the superficial anatomy, like you see, this is the, the, from the atlas superficial rotten. You can see that we need to be careful. We need to understand about the surface anatomy, but also in the left side, you see this is like a, a unseen anatomy, that you have to have an imagination. What's, uh, what is happening and what is the position of nuclear on track beneath the surface. Because uh, this will influence us how to decide 
from from where the best approach to remove the carbonoma. This is again very important because again, besides understanding the superficial anatomy, but also the unseen anatomy, which is beneath the surface. So the complication, uh, basically every injury on the track or nuclear in brainstem may cause complication. Of course, such a cranial nerve palsy, tetraparesis, hemiparesis, tetraesthesia, and others. So again, please be careful to see the anatomy and the unseen anatomy of the brainstem before we decide what is the entry to remove the carbonoma. So this is the indication, exopitic evacuable, of course, this is the indication and rapid progressive neurological deterioration, significant mass evac and multiple debilitating hemorrhages. And always uh, discussion, uh, anterior approach or posterior approach, yeah? Uh, Several carbonoma are very clear that we have to approach from posterior and some from anterior, from anterolateral, but some is in the gray area. Gray area means that we can approach from both either one anterior or posterior. And then what is the consideration? So if we approach from the anterior, this is the, we need to, to avoid the direct track uh, damage during the surgery and we need to understand mostly from the anterior is quite narrow window. Posterior, actually I love, I love posterior approach in the gray area and the clear posterior location of carbonoma. Because uh, this is like a wide surgical view. I will show you several cases that you can see. Uh, from posterior, again, we can see a very wide operation field. So this is our experience in rupture cavernous angioma. So sometimes the bleeding is inside the carbonoma and cause like a mass evac, like a tumor. So this is very important. If you see that it's like a, if the bleeding leaking through the weak wall of the carbonoma that cause so called halocyne. You can see this is a very beautiful halocyne that even I saw only once in my life. Because halocyne is a very important sign where every neurosurgeon has to know. Because this is the best time to remove when you see the halocyne. Very, very uh, different approach. So this is another similar case. Uh, somebody treated my, by uh, my neurology colleagues from other city. They thought that is like a, that was like a hypertensive bleeding, but in in fact this is a carbonoma. Just because of too long, they wait more than three months that you see the halo is start to disappear. You see here, this is a halo, but the unclear halo compared with the former case, and this is completely different strategy. I mean, again, the answer is same surgery, but it's much more difficult to remove. I will show you later. So you see here, this is another case with a mixed intensity of the bleeding of the carbonoma, means this is a multiple bleeding. So uh, in this patient, he got several bleeding, maybe in the beginning is not so much clear, then they uh, did not aware. This is like a bleeding of carbonoma. And this is actually like a multiple carbonoma in this young boy. So you can see this is another case with subacute appearance, you can see here. And this is also indication to remove the carbonoma as soon as possible. And some cases, they cause a severe neurological deficit, mostly if the carbonoma located in the medulla. So I will show you also, actually, we have a couple of cases of carbonoma in the medulla, which is the surgery is much more complicated and easy, very easy to get complication. Because the size of the medulla, you know, this is very narrow. Is about one third of the pounds. And in the medulla, a lot of nuclei, mostly also lower cranial nerve is there. Then again, so most of the surgery carbonoma in the medulla cause complication. And I share the experience also with uh, my international college. They said also they always get complication in the carbonoma in the medulla. And of course, hopefully, the complication is not permanent. I will show you later. 
And of course, sometimes the bleeding is still small in, uh, in the uh, brainstem and we did not do any surgery. This is the hello sign I showed you before. This is the first case of our experience doing uh, brainstem surgery in Indonesia in 2001. Uh, you see here young guys with a quadriparesis and there is a very clear hello sign. Right, and again, at that time, actually, we did not have experience before, but because the patient came in an urgent situation, then we had to do something. These are poor people, then we need uh, we need to make like a fundraise for him, and then again, this is the surgery with a prone position, and you can see here, uh, prone position, we just uh, split a bit pawns in the lower pants. You see, this is a very beauty of the pawns, and. Again, this is like a moderate, but this gray area, whether you can approach from anterior or posterior, but I love posterior, I show you. And in this case, you see that once I found the capsule, I just removed the capsule. And this is like to look horrible because the capsule is surrounded by the liquid of the hematoma, then becoming very easy to remove only one spool and then remove. This is very, very exception case which we cannot do in every case. Again, because a very clear hello sign in this case, then you can just remove and in once we can do everything totally in the capsule. And this is the guy still alive up to now. And this is the post-op MRI. And you can see, uh, this is, I told you, if this is unclear, the hello is here. So if the case is unclear, you can see this is the same surgery, but Technically, it's much more difficult because everything is attached to the normal tissue. You can see here, right? So uh, here that we, we have to uh, piecemeal because we cannot remove once like the, when the hollow very clear. This is not a case of mid-print pontine cavernous angioma and we did approach in anterolateral. You can see here, this is a, a quite big mid uh, pons cavernoma. And again, need to understand anatomy from outside. This is a, a anterolateral approach. We can see we can just uh, pull uh, slightly <coughs> temporal lobe and we should cut the pen. Because again, uh, you can see here, this is the pawns and this is, uh, we have to dissect and shift the, the nerve gently, you see here. The best sign, if you see the chocolate landmark of the hemosiderin here, right? If you see hemosiderin from the surface, means this is the best place to enter the brainstem, right? You can see here, we just enter, deep and deep, then finally we did total removal in this case. So again, we need to study in the MRI very carefully and select where is the uh, hemosiderin reaching the pile. If we do good there, almost sure that we can avoid uh, the complication, unless we don't see hemosiderin from the surface. So this is not the case. You can see here, this is a small, actually, uh, cavernoma in the border of the pons and medulla. And because this is located in the quite superficial, then we can do surgery. It's not so difficult. This is the cavernoma. You can see here, this also like a chocolate sign go in uh, the tumor from this landmark. So this is very important to find the landmark. So this is the post-op uh, patient. And you can see here, this is quite similar, similar uh, <coughs> uh, cavernoma located uh, more down in the medulla, in the border of the medulla and the pons. And this is a deeper also cavernoma. This is quite different. So, I mean, I did complication in this surgery. You can see here, uh, again, we can come down here. And because this is like a deeper uh, position, you can see that we need to split. We need to go uh, to the midline and finally remove the cavernoma. But you see this uh, uh, sixth nerve palsy. This is the one of the important complications you need to know. Because if we need to approach posterior, very easy to get a sixth nerve palsy uh, during the surgery if the, we did not identify very well. So this is a posterior uh, surface of the 
of the medulla. You can uh, medulla and pons, and you can see here this is another case of fractured uh, young, very young girl. You can see here stria medullara here. Again, I prefer posterior and keep it line. Keep line is very important because actually in the normal position, uh, we do not find any nuclear in the midline. Everything is paramedian, right? And we just need to see where the, the crossing, the ducatio of the track uh, uh, in the brainstem. Anyway, in this case, we, we uh, remove the tumor uh, piecemealy, you can see here. Then this is a post-op MRI. And this is in children, uh, much more quicker to get uh, recovery. This is 10 days after surgery, still hemiplegia as when she came. Then one month later, you can see the progress very, very well because it is in children. And again, select the position is very, very important to decide where to approach. This is a good point time, multiple cavernous angioma. You can see here, this is a multiple bleeding. It's a young boy. And we approach first, of course, from the posterior. And you can see here uh, the surgery. This is the nine years old boy with a sudden onset diplopia. You can see, we can meet the, the tumor first, then the, the hematoma later on. So this, this uh, like a layer here, means also multiple bleeding. So again, splitting the vermis is very important. Splitting the distal side of vermis is no harm. So in our cases, we don't have a complication of mutism because of the splitting vermis. Because if the location of the cavernoma is quite high, if we do not split the vermis, means that we will have to retract. Uh, severely and this is not good for the swollen process and maybe more complication during the surgery. So again this is uh, the boy after surgery and he came to my clinic regularly and uh, still is doing well. So this is not a case of uh, exorbitic medulla. You see here this is the medulla covers angioma. Surgery is not very difficult because you know that uh, because this is exorbitic then you can see uh, this is the medulla, uh, cervical cord, and then this another case. This is uh, I told you before. Cavernoma is in the brain, in the medulla, right? And the patient came with a hemiparesis and the lower cranial nerve palsy. Medulla is very one of the smallest part, and again I approach from posterior like this, and again because this is located. We need the surface, we need to split the surface. Again, we need to understand the anatomy. And you can see here, we split the surface of the medulla. So slowly here, because again, it's located about one millimeter beneath the surface. Then you can see finally, we find the cavernoma. Be careful, again, keep midline. It's very important. Don't go anywhere else. Right, finally, we found there is the cavernoma. Right, then we can piece, uh, piecemeal remove very slowly and again manipulation in the brainstem, mostly in the medulla, has to be very, very, very gentle because again, this is only as big as uh, our finger. And again, every manipulation, every touching, every damaging of the nuclear or the tract will cause any complication. So anyway, this is the surgery of the medulla, and this is the patient. And he need to use uh, ND tube two months. Fortunately, after two months, we can remove the ND tube, recover. So in several cases, uh, based in our international discussion with our colleague, many of them permanent complication. This is a big problem because again, in the medulla, there are many nuclei of the lower cranial nerve palsy. Once we damage, it may cause permanent uh, uh, dysphagia, and this is very, very bad for the patient. This is not the case of the midbrain cavernoma, and this is not so complicated also. We can do a uh, uh, case of uh, <clears throat> subtemporal approach. This is a lower pons cavernoma. We do in a sigmoid approach. You can see here. <clears throat> This is not the case of the midbrain pons cavernoma. This is a 29 years old female. You can see here, this is quite big cavernoma. And it was bleeding one month before 
she came to me. You can see this is a really big one and uh, located in the middle, uh, in the pons and midbrain. You see here, this quite long, big cavernoma. And again, this is like a, a wife of poor husband. Anyway, we have made a fundraising for him. And we did the position with a sitting position. This is the best approach, as you see here, with sitting position, we can have a very good uh, view uh, because the cerebellum will graphically going lower. And of course, operator is a bit problem, yeah, because this is very, really very exalted and very uh, not a good position for the operator. Anyway, but this is the best, best uh, position to reach the cavernoma. So be careful because we did couple of cases of uh, sitting position and we got a uh, couple of cases of RMOLI. This is very important to discuss with anesthesiologists yeah, to, to, to always keep in touch and have to stay there and don't leave the patient because anesthetists will, will see the change of the ECG when the RMOLI coming. It's very important. Yeah? If we did a sitting position, anesthesiologists have to be ready in every second never leave the, uh, the operating theater while we are doing sitting position in this uh, patient. So you see here, this is the cerebellum coming down by gratifically and we can find here, this is again, this is uh, the sign of a chocolate sign here. Then we come inside. Then finally, the target, the goal is total removal of the carbonoma. So again, this is the only uh, brainstorm cavernoma we did with a sitting position. And the other is just about uh, posterior and anterior uh, position. So this is the post -top. <laughs> And I thank you very much for your attention uh, with my sharing of Cavernous Anjuma. Welcome to Indonesia. Anytime we make a fun, and make a conference together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ekka. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? He's a very yes, senior neurosurgeon. Yeah. question? Yes, go ahead. Yes, Prof. Ekka, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, my question is, how do you differentiate a cavernoma from, uh, like a midbrain cavernoma from a, a midbrain stroke? especially when it's a late subacute phase. You do your MRI, it's the first bleed where you don't have a hemosiderin link. Uh, it's just the first bleed at the late uh, subacute phase. How do you differentiate? How do you diagnose that this is a cavernoma comparing to a midbrain stroke? Ah, thank you very much. Uh, Normally, I discuss with my, my colleague in the MR department, yeah, it will be very clear uh, whether this is the hypertensive uh, bleeding or cavernoma because you can see capsule. And if, for instance, uh, you are not sure and if the, the patient condition is still very good, we don't need to be very hurry to do surgery at the time, right? Again, uh, normally, we can see capsule very clear in the cavernous angioma ruptured, and which is we don't see it in the uh, hypertensive bleeding. Thank you. And uh, just a very quick question. I don't know if I miss, but uh, do you uh, use the um, the monitoring during this kind of operation, or do you have experience with that, or what do you recommend? Uh, thank you, Rosanna. Of course, we do monitoring. So, but when, the, when I started in 001, we did not have any monitoring. Again, mm -hmm. to me, the most important is again, really understand the anatomy and the unseen anatomy, because we should imagine, for instance, right, we go down posterior, we will, we will meet the sixth track, we will meet the sixth nuclear axial uh, Of course, we did monitor, but uh, again, be careful, important is understand the unseen anatomy, if possible, of course, uh, uh, try to avoid complication to make any more morbidity after surgery. But this is not very easy. I mean, don't promise to to big to, to your patient because uh, brainstem surgery is mostly medulla is really complicated. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Yeah, 
No, beautiful, beautiful presentation and a great experience. Really impressive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eka, for sharing your experience. And you, we'll move on to our next presentation. I invite Dr. Roberto Herrera from Argentina. He's the head of neurosurgical services at the Belgrade Adventist Clinic. And he's also the intra of MRI program director. And he's an eminent vascular neurosurgeon. And he's going to talk to us on complications in cerebral revascularization. Dr. Herrera. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, I'm sharing my... Uh, this meeting. Hmm? This meeting. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm looking, I looking for my presentation. Yes, you can click on your presentation and then it'll come. Click on my presentation, okay. Can you see it? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, it's okay? Yes. Yes, it's okay. You can start. Yes, good morning. My country, it is nine in the morning. Um, I'm going to talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you, my friend Anila Dabar and, and the women in neurosurgery for inviting me to this web meeting. Um, I'm going to talk about our experience in, in high flu bypass um, complication in this, in this reverse the brain reverse surgery. Um, this is my country. I'm in, I'm in Buenos Aires. This is Argentina, under to Brazil in South America. And this is our clinic, Belgrano Adventist Clinic. Uh, it is located in Buenos Aires. Complications in in talking about uh, specifically in five two bypass. After 1985, um, this publication uh, um, respect the Canadian study, the aspirin was a true executioner of the bypass surgery for almost 30 years or and, and more too. Fortunately, many neurosurgeons continue doing this kind of bypass surgery. And Professor Sand published in 1987 this important work about uh, revascularization surgery in the brain. Um, this bypass was made for me in 1987. Um, for the patient to, to take to she, she take this and she did scan uh, and you can see bypass was patent patency 28 years after the surgery I did this bypass uh, um, I think 30, 31 years ago bypass was but then 28 years after surgery, and this picture was taken um, three or four years ago. This is another case, Angel CD, 23 years after surgery. Um, this, this surgery was published in a newspaper in, in my city, in my, in my country. You can see here, October 6, 1991. And this bypass was patency all this time with some grade of atherosclerosis, but the bypass was working here. In the last 10 years, bypass surgery, uh, we, we can see many books and um, papers about uh, cerebral revascularization. Uh, in Google, you can see a thousand and thousand of uh, papers about it, um, about bypass, brain bypass. In the main web page of the university, the, the, around the world, you can see uh, bypass surgery videos, records in, in, in YouTube, 
uh, causes around all the world, microvascular robotic uh, anastomosis, um, and the bypass surgery back to the cover of the main journal of neurosurgery in the world. 30, more than 30 years after Canadian study. In our department, these are the, the main indication for to do uh, high pool bypass. Cerebrovascular disease in selective cases, surgery to prevent brain ischemia, giant or complex aneurysm is the, the, the best indication for, for high pool bypass. Tumors that involve internal carotid artery and carotid cavernous fistula, when this cannot be solved by endovascular work. So I do high blue bypass. Uh, this is a sample session, not complicated, because uh, we um, work in the brain no more than one hour. Uh, we need 30 minutes to open sedan fissure and 30 minutes to do a uh, micro suture in the brain. No more, the, the, the rest of the time, we are working in the legs, in the neck, in, in, with the craniotomy, but not in the brain. It is different than the direct attack giant aneurysm. But this actually uh, has uh, different steps, and you have to respect all of them. And this is my team working at, at the same time to shorten the time of the, the final time of the, the total time of the surgery. Yeah, you can see um, two doctors removing the, the graft, bend, and, and, and two more doing the craniotomy and the neck exposition. Uh, this is the surgical position, the same to do any uh, perioneal approach. Uh, and the next incision, the head incision, you can pass the graft in front or, or behind the ear. This is the craniotomy. This is uh, a big craniotomy. It is not necessary. With the perioneal approach, it's, it's enough. And here you can see the detail of the tube, the tube through which we are going to pass the graph. The next exposition, common carotid artery, internal carotid artery, external, we are going to do the, um, the distal anastomosis here to avoid uh, brain arrest during the, the, the suture. This is, oh, excuse me, this is the, the way the graph here uh, and, and here we are preparing both legs to to get the the graph the vein graph we use saphenous vein this is the preparation of the patient we can use continuous incision or interrupt incision you can uh, call vascular absorption you can get the graph um, with some doctor in, in, in your open team. Uh, in, to, um, it is important to prevent mistake with the orientation of the vein because if you turn around the vein, the valves of the vein um, can stop the, the, the blood flow and the bypass uh, uh, not work. This is the vein. We pass the vein um, in front of the ear here. Um, it is preparing to, to do the anastomosis. This is the external carotid artery, the vein, the punch to the anastomosis. We use this vascular punch. It is normal, it's a common punch. Um, it are, they, they are used for vascular session. And we prefer continuous suture in the, in the external carotid artery. You, you have time with uh, internal carotid artery is, is free. You can, if, if you prefer, you can do interrupted suture here. We, 
we do continuous shooting. And this is the, the distal anastomosis, the vein and the external carotid artery. This is the, the vein plenty, the blood, and this is the, the vein um, ready for, for the distal anastomosis. Open the matter. And the anastomosis is, is made in the normal way like you learn in the lab. Hmm? We select middle cerebral artery, temporal branch, and the microanastomosis is, is a normal microanastomosis, so principal feature is called the, the middle cerebral artery. And but this is a good detail. Um, respect this microstructure, um, distal microstructure, we uh, prefer to do one phase with continuous continue suture because um, it shortens the time. We try to spend less than 30 minutes in, in all the microstructure, distal microstructure. And uh, doing continuous suture on one phase, we shorten the time, the final time. And the other side, interrupted suture. Why? Because it allows the distal mouth of the bypass to be able to grow between one inch and, and one stitch and the other. The wall of the vein and the wall of the artery will be able to grow in the time. Okay. After, after microstructure, we check with Doppler if the bypass patency is, is good, if, if we are, uh, we are sure with the blood flow of the bypass. If you have some doubt about the permeability, the patency of the graft or the bypass, we have a open clamp. Mm, and, and occlude the internal carotid artery 50%, and the patient go to, to the unit, uh, intensive care unit, and the other side with the patient away um, under um, neurological examination, you can uh, complete the occlusion of the internal carotid artery, and, and if the patient is well, you, you can uh, back the patient to the operating room, open, reopen the neck, and, and proceed to, to occlude definitely uh, the internal carotid artery. Nowadays, you can, um, you can awake the patient during the surgery. You can occlude the internal carotid artery um, and take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, hour. And if the patient is well, in the, at the same, same time, you can occlude the internal carotid artery and go to the patient out of the, of the operating room. Mm. In this case, the clown was removed and internal carotid artery was occluded definitely uh, the next day after surgery with these two strong curves. It's internal carotid artery here, and this is the external carotid artery, and this is the graph from, with the bypass wall. Okay, for closing of the uh, close of the wounds to, to prevent through the bypass when you are uh, procedure to the close the craniotomy. And I'm going to show you some cases. For example, you can see here the bypass behind the ear, this is the vein in young woman. It was a very very Interesting case with this bilateral Cheyenne aneurysm, carotid cavernous Cheyenne aneurysm. We decided to do this first on the right, first bypass here with occlusion, occlusion of the internal carotid artery with complete solution of the aneurysm. And six months later, we uh, did the same on the other side. This is the bypass. 
no aneurysm, and good perfusion of the midazole lab. Is it the patient, anxious CT, anxious MRI? Is it the same? Bypass here, bypass here, and no more aneurysm. <laughs> and this is, this is the patient, you can see the bypass grow. Uh, this was nine years uh, after surgery, and bypass, bilateral bypass grow. Uh, Sacutaneous hematoma, a uh, minor complication, you can, you can see this complication, but you can see this kind of complication with subcutaneous hematoma in the course of the graft with this spasm or partial occlusion of the graft, and in this case it is necessary to remove the graft. Uh, this is the same. You can see here the vein is thin. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was necessary to remove the cloth to, to preserve the bypass. Extradural or subdural hematoma are complications. Complication could spoil completely the such thing. It is important to prevent subdural hematoma in these cases. Uh, we have this case with refilling of the aneurysm, and we treat it through the bypass because we don't. don't it doesn't uh, has internal carotid artery, and we did endovascular treatment with coils in the aneurysm and complete occlusion of this refilling of the aneurysm, and the bypass was completely permanent. This is the same. This is another unexpected complication. It is important to um, have all the, the surgical field under the vision of the resurgeon because this area was uh, occluded by the, the surgical field and uh, we broke the, the skin with the patch pin when we are going, we, we, we pass the, the gap. Mm -hmm. We finished the, uh, the surgery, removed the surgical field and we found this, we, we find, found this. We resolve this complication, opening skin, putting the, the graft under the skin and, and closing, closing the, the wounds and the patient was well, no, with no infection. This is the same. Uh, the age of the patient is not a problem to make a high flu bypass. In this case is 74 years old man. Yeah, you can see the bypass, no aneurysm here. This is the patient, this is the, the bypass working here. Mm -hmm. Deepest in the Syrian fissure, and, and this is the bypass after the, behind the, the ear and the patient. The high flu bypass can be done to, in case of acute bleeding. Mm, this patient, 53 years, you can see the hematoma here because acute subarachnoid hemorrhagia. Mm, the bypass yeah, yeah. The thrombosis, the aneurysm, and this is the patient. I'm on a webinar uh, right now. Something. After surgery, and the patient six months after surgery completely recovered. And you can do kaifu bypass in, in children too. This and, and in, in previously uh, embolized aneurysm. The hyperbolic bypass can be done in case of previously embolized shine aneurysm in children. You can see this huge aneurysm here, post traumatic aneurysm. We decided to do hyperbolic bypass. This is the bypass, eh? proximal suture, distal suture. This is the bypass. This is uh, um, angio MRI with occlusion of the aneurysm, and this is uh, digital angiography, the coils at complete occlusion of the aneurysm, preserving the distal brain circulation. And this is the patient six months uh, after the, the SARS. Um, respect the bibliography, you can see that the bypass, it, um, it has the best results 
Endovascular treatment, if you review the bibliography, you can see um, uh, with endovascular treatment, we have 20% morbidity, 40%, uh, 14% mortality. While in direct attack, uh, this is um, 18 the all morbidity and 11 immortality. But in bypass surgery, you have 11 poor results and only 5% of mortality. This is 84% of occlusion, definitely, the definitely occlusion of the annuities. Again, 40% in endovascular treatment and 71 in, in diarrhea attack. We have to consider this, by this technique in the treatment of some pathology nowadays. Uh, and this is my question. Why bypass surgery was always the best treatment or a good treatment for complex and shy and dangerous and practica practically was not taken into account for almost 30 years. Um, we have to review this, this concept. Uh, endovascular treatment, treatment nowadays is more expensive, not so good results, but it is more used. And uh, bypass is the cheapest treatment with the best results and uh, less used nowadays. Cardinal surgeon responsibility in this, can we ch change this? I think we have to consider, reconsider the bypass surgery and the high proof bypass surgery um, in, in many pathologies. Mm, uh, and I think the resurgeon uh, 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 concept nowadays mm, and I think in the next year we 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 go many works, many papers um, about the application of uh, in school based surgery of the, the different techniques of the bypass. Thank you very much, and and thank you all women in neurosurgery for inviting me for inviting. Me. Thank you. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Anil Nanda. Everyone knows him as a doyen of skull base and vascular neurosurgery. He is currently the professor and chairman at the Department of Neurosurgery at Rutgers, New Jersey. And he is involved in a lot of educational activities of the AANS and the CNS. Uh, Dr. Anil Nanda, welcome. Yes, yes. So this is a cavernous malformation on a young boy. He's 17 years old. This had bled three times and uh, all twice he was completely intact. So here you can see I'm going right into the brainstem, small opening right into the floor of the brainstem. And uh, he had bled twice and you know the data is the brainstem cav mouths will bleed again. The first two bleeds he was totally intact, but in this last bleed he was hemiparetic and he had slight facial weakness. So because of that, we decided it'd be time to take this. We gave him the option of taking it out, offered him gamma knife. Uh, you can see we're now in the uh, brainstem right there. Very fine. And you, have to, you, know, you don't like to retract laterally on the brainstem. Here you can see the cavernous malformation. Uh, it has this sort of uh, mulberry appearance like you always expect. Um, and it's a nice plane there. I don't like to retract medially on the brain stem because that's where you get the deficits. Uh, and here you can see a beautiful plane. I've had recurrences with brain stem cav mouth, so I'm really manic about digging every little piece because sometimes you leave a little piece that's a real problem. And once again, I apologize for running late. It was 5.30 in the morning here and I was on and then Dr. Park gave to be a little bit later. And I think I overslept, so I apologize for that. Yeah. No problem. So here it is. Now you can see the last residual part. And this is where in the brainstem, you know, you tend to get like, okay, I'm going to get in and get out. But I've seen recurrences, so I just am very manic about getting every little piece off. Uh, and here you can see that it's right, um, a complete resection, last piece that we're removing right there.
here you can see mulberry appearance yeah and here i like the seal right there in the center of the rain stem I actually have slides of him. Just making sure complete hemostasis with these, you know, because I really like using flow seal inside the brain stem, but any hemostatic agent is fine. I think you have to be really cautious that everything is completely clean. We sutured this and he he had he had definitely worsening after this he had uh, his facial paresis was worse uh, but I'd actually like to show the actual films let me just get those one second yeah. um, I'm gonna try and pull those out but anyway very well and I, I just think I, you know I have a series of these brain stem lesions you have to be very meticulous. I know Eka just presented that he likes to go in a sitting position. I like to do these, um, you know, I, I, I either go from the back or I'll go into hemispheric as well. So I like to have the, the uh, brain stem fall to the side and they go through the occipital lobe. Uh, let me just see this again. I'm trying to see if I can actually get to the eight films here. No, I don't have it there one second. Uh, but anyway, the films look great, and he, he did very well. But I'm open to any questions or anything that you might have. I apologize. It's, I couldn't get this in the right time, and it wasn't done properly. But it's the first time I've done this. so, And it's 4.30 in the morning here, so I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Dr. Nanda. We have you, and I think any, anyone has any questions for him, that would be great. We apologize for the early morning. Drill no, no, him. no. And now that I've done this, next time I'll be better equipped. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. So we call you again next time, maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much. So do you have any questions? Do you have any questions for Dr. Nanda? Okay. So. Thank you uh, so thanks. much. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we'll move on to the last presentation. And this is actually from a young neurosurgeon who has just finished her fellowship with Professor Kato, and now she's doing a fellowship with Dr. Osaka, uh, with Dr. Ohata, I think, at Osaka City University. And she's going to be talking to us on a recent study on demystifying white matter injuries in aneurysmal SH with DTI, Dr. Sneha Chitra. She's from India. She's uh, trained in South, South of India, and now she's in Japan. Dr. Sneha, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, you can. A very, all right. uh, a very good afternoon, good evening from Japan to all the eminent faculty there. Uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, honor for me to have this opportunity to present this recent work I did at Fujita under Professor Yoko Kato in this panel with uh, so many great people out there worldwide. My respects to all of you there. So, this is my presentation here. So demystifying white matter injury in aneurysmal SAH with DTI. I'm thankful to all the faculty at the Fujita Health University and my fellows for making this possible. Cognitive dysfunction is the most common morbidity after aneurysmal SAH. We have so many patients in the follow-up OPDs with one of these problems. It could be memory loss, behavioral changes, an amnestic state, and more often we have the sleep issue. They're telling me not, I'm not able to sleep. And these are the manageable ones. We have patients at the other end of the spectrum who are minimally conscious or in the vegetative state. It could be transient, three to six months is the usual recovery time, or unfortunately permanent in a few patients. So early brain injury after a new small SH can be both in the gray matter and white matter. Now this is this white matter injury that we are focusing on today, which could be focal or global. It could be due to the blood-brain barrier disruption, neuroinflammation, or ischemic and oxidative stress, or the direct mechanical disruption of the fibers due to the hemorrhage. Now, it is this undetected white matter injury which is not picked up on conventional imaging, 
that is the reason for the cognitive decline in these patients. Now, a very uh, few simple uh, facts about the diffusion imaging. It was initially used in 1990s for stroke. Now we have the tractography or the fiber tracking, which is revolutionary. It is a non-invasive window to the white matter connectivity of the human brain. Now, what are the current applications of tractography? Ischemia, infection, tumors, demyelinating diseases, pre-surgical planning, especially for tumors and epilepsy. A lot of research in diffuse axonal injury is going on, but in the recent five years, we have a lot of fiber tracking to assess the cognitive and motor outcome in stroke. And the recovery period, fiber tracking is extremely useful. You can actually see the plasticity and an improvement in the number of fibers in the recovery period. So, uh, a small slide to show the basic principles. It is on the Brownian motion of water molecules. We are tracking this anisotropic diffusion of the water molecules across the membranes. And we are placing regions of interest and we are deriving the microarchitecture of the brain in an indirect way. So these are the eigen vectors x, y, z, and we calculate the diffusion ellipsoids and derive the fibers. So this is how a normal fiber tracking in a normal brain looks like. The color coding is red, blue, and green. And when we are going to apply this to study consciousness and cognitive dysfunction, we need to know what is the basis of consciousness. So we have the ARAS, the brainstem and the thalamus, which forms the core of the human consciousness, the aroused cell system. And then we have the awareness system, wherein the limbic system, along with the papus and the mammalothalamic tract, and the basal forebrain bundles, they form the core of what we are, how we emote, the behavior and the memory. So in short, the awareness. Arousal and awareness make the normal human consciousness. So this is how the papus circuit and the limbic system looks on a seven Tesla Hardy MRI tractography taken from a paper by Choi et al. And this is based on the anatomical fiber tracking done by Dr. Abida by the Kingler technique. So because we know the anatomical fiber tracking, it is very difficult to implement the same into the diffusion imaging to derive the fibers. So your basic anatomy is extremely important. This is the ascending reticular activating system tracking done by Rubiano et al. We see these four brain tracks which are extremely important and found these impaired in most of our patients. Now what we did in Fujita was to do this tractography in the post-operative aneurysm patients with cognitive dysfunction. This was a rupture ecom aneurysm with a GCS of 13, a Hunton Hess of four. The patient was clipped immediately. This is the post-op CT. The patient continued to remain in E2VTM5, had a very stormy postoperative case, had to undergo a decompression and a shunt. This is the MRI at six weeks. This is the shunt-related artifact. And the DTI is showing significant white matter damage. This is the cingulum and the pharynx on the right side, shunt-related artifact, and on the left, these are completely absent. So here you can see gross disruption of the fibers in the forebrain and thinning of the cingulum on the side of the aneurysm, the side which was operated left side. Case number two was an MCA aneurysm. This patient remained in a vegetative state even one year after the clipping, E4 VTM5. This is the CT one year after the clipping, which was done elsewhere. And this is the MRI and the fiber tracking complete loss of the frontal fold brain bundles. So you can see gross disruption and no wonder the patient remains in the minimally conscious state. So this is a bezel top aneurysm. Patient walks into the OPD and he collapses right there. And a grade four SAH with IVH. This patient underwent a coiling embolization and post-operatively, his GCS remained to be mild confusion, uh, borderline disorientation. We wanted to know why he was not doing good. So the imaging picked up a very small hematoma, probably EVD insertion related. And the tractography showed a very minor disruption of the fibers. And yet this could be accounted for his memory disturbances and the disorientation he was having. So in summary, we had the cingulum and the fornix in ACOM aneurysm. MCA was the gross disruption in the right frontal forebrain bundle. And the basilar top, even a subtle disruption in the small white matter fibers in the right frontal, led to the confusion in this patient. 
there was a corresponding decrease of the fractional anisotropy values in all these cases. So going through the literature, in the past five years, we had significant work done on tractography in aneurysmal SAH. They demonstrated changes in the ARS following a shunt operation for hydroclasculus. They, should, uh, they could actually show the increase in fibers following a shunt. There was injury of the mammalothalamic tract in patients with SH, especially in the ACOM patients, injuries of the fornix. Again, multiple injuries. It could be injury because of the IVH, SH, or the ICH. Different parts of the ARAS could be affected on the whole, contributing to the either minimal conscious state or the vegetative state of the patient. Injury of the pappus acute, again, that is responsible for the memory changes that we very commonly see. To summarize, we have the fornic cingulum, commissural fibers, and pappus acute accounting for the memory disturbances, especially in ACOM. The amnestic syndrome, impairment of reason memory alone in mammalothalamic tract. The frontal basal connecting fibers, the behavioral changes. And when this system is knocked off the ARAS, we're going to have a very bad outcome, decreased arousal, minimally conscious state, and vegetative state. So to conclude, with tractography, early recognition of white matter injury is possible. It is a potential futuristic tool to predict the recovery time. You can actually say the patient's caregiver see it's going to take quite a long time and we can tailor his rehabilitation and pharmacotherapy based on the quantification of white matter damage. We can also say whether his cognitive dysfunction is going to be residual or permanent. What's the future? It's quite exciting. There are research papers on white matter injury targeted therapeutics. And now we have the 7 Tesla MRA. Now, when this is applied for fiber tracking, we can even detect the smallest of white fibers and improve the accuracy of saying, hey, that is where the exact damage is. This is how our post-op patient is going to do. I'm once again extremely thankful for this opportunity to present my research paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sneha. That is great work. And I wish you all the best and that you continue doing you. work. So this comes, we come to an end to our seminar. Dr. Sharon has just finished her clipping, but she won't be able to reach on time to do a presentation. So now we have a couple, five minutes. If we have any mutual discussion or any questions for anybody. Anila, unmute yourself. I have a question uh, for Dr. Sneha. Dr. Sneha, yes. I want to ask you, um, uh, was your DTI done before the clipping or after the clipping? I believe it's after the clipping. And uh, my question is that how do you know that this is a natural damage from subarachnoid hemorrhage or technical damage done by the surgeon during the technical manipulation? Because in ACOM, sometimes we go through the gyrus rectus and a lot of uh, behavioral and cognitive fibers are around that area. And my second question is, did you repeat the DTI in three months or six months or a year later to see if there's any change in them? Thank you. Thank you for those questions. First of all, all these cases were post-procedural, post-clipping or post-embolization. And yes, very correctly pointed out, the surgical damage is a part of the damage damage that's caused in addition to the primary uh, damage caused by the hemorrhage. And that one case of basilar aneurysm, the frontal damage was due to the EVD. So it was no way directed uh, to the uh, SAH and the IVH. And uh, regarding the second question, yes, we proposed to follow up these patients at three and six months. This was done last month. All these patients were collected over the last 30 days. So we have a proposal to follow up at three months and six months. And there are research papers which have shown the recovery in form of uh, increase in number of tracks and improvement in the FA values when they were followed up at three and six months. That is exactly the prognostication value of this uh, fiber tracking. So yes, we propose to do that. Thank you. And then the fibers you're talking about is the fibers mostly that are going anterior posteriorly, right? The green fibers, not the commercial fibers that are going right to left. Yes, uh, the frontal forebrain bundles are the green ones, but the cingulum and the pappus fibers also have a part of the association bundles. So it is not all or none. It is a combination of several fibers. And the three Tesla MRA is still not enough to pick up even the, uh, the smaller bundles or the smaller association fibers. So we would need okay. more cases and more reporting. Okay, great. Anira, what happens is in SAH, probably the anterior commissure is there. Which is, uh, which is a big component of the limbic system with a lot of emotional memory 
then you have the fornix that is right behind it and then from the mammillary body you have the tract going up to the cingulum and down to the brain stem in the you know mammillary tegmental tract and then the medial fourth brain bundle they are all the key structures probably involved in consciousness memory and you know that kind which might be damage it's which might have incurred damage due to the sh itself i mean that's what i feel yeah. because all of them are caused yeah. by yeah, yeah so that's true that's true great, great. So, John, yeah, yeah sorry, Abhi, go ahead. No, over to you, Anila. You can, you can. Okay, great, great. So, John, I think it's time for us to conclude. Um, I want to thank all our international participants. I want to thank all the attendees. And I hope you had a lot of learning from the giants that we had today. Uh, Dr. Ika, Dr. Anil Nanda, Dr. Roberto Herrera, Dr. Yashimura, Dr. Rosanna and uh, Dr. Suchandra and Dr. Sneha. I thank you all of you for accepting to come to this webinar, educating the future neurosurgeons, uh, educating the current neurosurgeons as well. And, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. I just want to let you know that this entire presentation is available on YouTube. So in any case, if you have a residency program and you want to show it to your residents, uh, you can just show it directly from the YouTube. I am certainly planning to show it to my residents this Tuesday. So thank you, everyone. And John, back to you now. Oh, hi, Anila. I'm John Bennett of Neurosurgical TV. Um, it's a pleasure working with the neurosurgical community, and we hope to continue these excellent presentations. Thank you. <laughs>